All right, Baba Nation celebrates Anand Chaturdashi, and as we bid Lord Ganesha goodbye, we take a promise from him to come next year as well. After that emotional farewell to Lord Ganesha, as we take a promise from him to come back next year. Here on the screen, we show you all the visuals pouring in from across the country, and ED now wishes you on this auspicious occasion. Well, on that note, a very good morning to all of our viewers. You've tuned into ET now, and this is Market Cafe with me, Cheryl D'Souza. Along with me, I have uh, Shreyansi who's joined us. Uh, uh, Shreyansi, very good morning to you. And yes, today is the big, big day. You have the FOMC meet outcome that will be out only late in the night, and we'll get the reaction tomorrow when you talk of the Asian markets, or for the matter of our US markets as well. But for now, what's this uh, screen throwing up? What what is uh, the trend looking like when you talk of the US markets? Well, absolutely. Good morning, Cheryl. And it's a very interesting move that we're seeing play out when it comes to Wall Street, right? Because what really is happening is that investors have been waiting for some cues and that is the one that we're watching out for. We've been telling you about it. We've been telling you about what is really priced in and currently what is priced in is a 50 basis points rate cut. And that is something that we've been sort of thinking about well uh, when you take a look at the move on wall street then wall street is coming off a mixed session that saw the s p 500 edge up just a tad bit so not a very decisive move coming in when you're looking at the s p 500 when you take a look at dow jones as well a loss of about 16 points so not much of a move coming in there as well and when you take a look at nasdaq added just about two tenths of a percent there as well so not a very decisive move when you take a look at wall street a mixed handover is what we have and when you take a look at what is really priced in, there's a 63% chance of a 50 basis point rate cut, like I mentioned, 37% or the stacked of a 25 basis point move as well. So that currently is the kind of expectation that we have when it comes to what the Fed's trajectory is going to look like. And this is really just something that we've all been on high alert for ahead of that first expected rate cut from the Fed at the conclusion of that two-day policy meeting that we've been all watching very, very closely. Lastly, let's take a very quick look at Europe as well and when you take a look at the European screen as well you're looking at stocks closing just a tad bit higher ahead of the central bank decision that's in focus here. Absolutely all eyes on that big decision that will be out late in the evening but let's talk about what's happening in the commodities market because if you look at crude uh, prices they've settled higher in an overnight trading session, this on back of the supply shock, I will just tell you what that is all about. And also the prospects of the US interest rate cuts. Remember the street is debating between 25 basis point or the 50 basis point where now the street is quite tilted towards the 50 basis point rate cut coming in from the FOMC meet. But we we'll all, all eyes on Jerome Powell, what he actually decides late in the evening or the entire FOMC uh, meet outcome. But let's talk about what exactly the crude is doing. Like I said, it uh, rose by a dollar a barrel uh, in the overnight trading session. You had the WTI crude that settled uh, around 71.41 uh, dollar uh, per barrel, while the Brent crude actually saw a settlement of around 1.3% higher at around $73.7 uh, per barrel. If you talk about the supply shock that I was talking about a short while ago, it's actually more than 12% of the crude output from the US Gulf of Mexico was offline this after a hurricane hit last week on back of that that uh, sort of aided the oil prices in the four out of the last five trading session also you saw a rebound coming in the Brent crude from its lowest levels in about three years that had hit earlier on in the week apart from that there are some tensions or renewed tensions in the Middle East area as well Remember that you had uh, those uh, those uh, pages detonating across Lebanon yesterday and on back of that you have a heightened tension coming in in that region as well. Apart from that you also have a supply dis disruption that's happening in Libya and that's also one of the reasons why you've seen this uh, sort of uh, jump come in the crude oil prices. But also staying with uh, oil, reports suggest the Biden administration will seek up to six million dollars per uh, six million barrels of oil for the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, a purchase that, if completed, will match its largest yet in the, repl uh, in the replenish pl uh, replenishment of the stash after its historic sale in 2022. The United States will buy the oil from energy companies for delivery in the first few months of 2025. Well up. Uh
Well, absolutely, Cheryl, and there's a lot of events that we should keep on our radar, of course. That's that all-important FOMC meet outcome, and that is something that we're all watching out for. But when you take a look at cues from the UK that we're watching out for, the CPI as well as PPI input data coming in. From the Eurozone, you do have the CPI data set, and from Japan, there's trade data as well. So, a very data-heavy week when you look at uh, zones, across zones, you have a very data-heavy week coming in. And in terms of other events, of course, there's JNK that is holding first phase of assembly polls. And the finance minister is also launching NPS Batsalya scheme, and that is the one that we're also all watching out for, Shajal. Absolutely, and yes, we, we cannot get enough uh, about that big event that all eyes are on, uh, especially when Jerome Powell speaks uh, later in the night uh, today. The U.S. Central Bank is expected to make its first interest rate cut in more than four years. Meanwhile, the debate around the rate cuts is no longer about when, but how much. The key question remains whether Powell-led FOMC will opt for a rare and a bold 50 basis point cut to tackle the recessionary fears or stick to the largely expected 25 basis point cut in the pursuit of a soft landing for the economy. Calls for an outsized rate cuts are growing louder with about 60% of the Wall Street traders predicting a 50 basis point rate cut coming in by the FOMC. By end of 2024, uh, markets are expecting a total reduction of at least 100 basis points in the first cycle, uh, first rate cut cycle in over four years uh, since 2020. The biggest trigger for stock prices, however, would be Powell's motivation behind the cut and the dot plot. So you have to watch out for the commentary coming in from uh, uh, Jerome Powell as well. We spoke to Manish Singh to understand what's the street expectations from the FOMC meet and whether which side of the fence is he tilting on, whether it's a 50 basis point rate cut or a 25 basis point rate cut. Listen in. The reason why I think Fed is going to cut 50 and why it should cut 50 is that if the inflation is, is on track to be at 2%, is at 2.5% now, what justifies the rates being this restrictive we have seen the most rapid increase in rates in the last 40 years. The rates have been at 5.25% for 14 months. What justifies it being at this high restrictive level? There's no point. So I think for that reason, you're going to get 50 basis point cut. The swing and roundabouts you are seeing in the market prediction of rate cut 25 or 50 is just down to short-term tradings in futures that you see in rates market. That should not be a det determining factor in where the rate should be. What I think the market is going to look for is that that 50 basis point cut comes with a narrative which, which says that this is the right thing to do, the rates are very restrictive, but it doesn't come with the view that we are trying to avert a recession, which is not my base case scenario. All right, so Manish Singh also pricing in a 50 basis point rate cut, much like the rest of the market. But moving on, then Americans, meanwhile, have spent more than expected at retail stores in August. Sales have ticked up one tenth of a percent from July after jumping the most in a year and a half the previous month. Sales jumped 1.4 percent for online retailers and rose seven tenths of a percent at health and personal care outlets. The data, of course, indicates that consumers are still able and willing to spend despite the cumulative impact of inflation and lofty interest rates. And shifting focus away from macros, then iPhone maker Apple is reportedly in talks with JP Morgan Chase for the bank to take over their flagship credit card program from Goldman Sachs. The discussions are still in early stages and key elements of deals such as the price and whether JP Morgan could, uh, could continue certain features of the Apple cards are yet to be decided. All right, so from one tech giant to the other then, Microsoft and BlackRock are collaborating alongside other entities to put together a whopping $100 billion towards setting up AI Infra. The GAIIP, or the Global Artificial Intelligence Infrastructure Investment Partnership, participants include GIP and MGX. The group aims to assemble $30 billion of initial capital with a future goal of bringing in up to $100 billion, including from debt financing. All right, the news from the tech doesn't end here. Meta Platforms has rolled out enhanced privacy and parental controls for Instagram accounts of users under the age of 18. A move aimed at addressing growing concerns around negative impact of social media, Meta will port all designated Instagram accounts automatically to teen accounts, which will be private accounts by default. 
and what is called a coordinated attack handheld pagers exploded in parts of Lebanon killing eight and injuring over 2,000 people it has impacted Hezbollah members as well as other individuals Iran's ambassador to Lebanon Moshtaba Amani is said to have sustained wounds as well reports suggest that the impact was also felt in Syria and Hezbollah has blamed Israel for the explosions the incident has overwhelmed the healthcare services in the region as well And moving on uh, to back home on the completion of 100 days of Modi 3.0 Sarkar, the group editor-in-chief of Times Network, that is Navika Kumar, had an exclusive conversation with IT Railways and IMB Minister Ashwini Vaishnav. He shares how the BJP has carried its core principle of growth from the previous two terms into the third term. Listen in. The work done in the first 100 days is a clear Example of that, if you look at just railways, within the first 100 days, 11 new lines, one multi-tracking project has been approved worth 50,000 crore total. 108 trains, we have augmented the general coaches. 12,500 general coaches have been sanctioned. 16 new Vande Bharat trains have been launched. A very popular and a very important train, Namo Bharat Rapid Rail has been launched yesterday by Honorable Prime Minister. This will make rail travel so comfortable between cities which are located close to each other. World's tallest, highest rail arch bridge, Chinab Bridge has been commissioned. 900 kilometers of track, 100 digital stations, 309 locomotives, 1,600 coaches, 10,000 wagons, ticketing enabled through UPI, 164 base kitchens done, 10 multimodal cargo terminals done, and 58,642 vacancies notified. Mr. Ashwini Vaishnav, uh, the first 100 days behind you now. What is the agenda for the next 100 uh, 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 days uh, for the government and uh, with the upcoming elections in states? Uh, do you think, once again, the BJP is on the back foot because Haryana, Maharashtra, uh, in, in both states, uh, perception is... Uh, uh, that the opposition ranks uh, taking the lead uh, or have an advantageous position as compared to the BJP and its alliance? People have seen the work which Prime Minister Narendra Modiji's government has done. People have that faith. People have seen the 58 years of Congress rule and the 10 years that Prime Minister Narendra Modiji's government has given. So... There is a good faith, there is a, there is a confidence that this is the only party, this is the only government which can really take our country to a new level of development, bring harmony in the society. So that confidence will ultimately translate into support for us and that support has been visible in the past in multiple ways and this will be again visible in the coming elections. Alright then, so that was an important conversation taking stock of 100 days of Modi 3.0 Sarkar. But we'll take a quick break and when we come back, we'll take a look at how the Asian markets are faring so you don't go anywhere. Welcome back. You're watching Market Cafe on ET now. Let's take a look at what the Asian markets are doing at this point in time. Remember, the most of the Asian markets have opened up for the trading session. And a positive move coming in for the Japanese market. As you can see, 6 cents of percent uptick coming in for Japanese market. This week, uh, along uh, with the FOMC meet outcome that was due today, uh, we will also be seeing a slew of other central bankers across that will be uh, coming out with the, their uh, policy decisions. One of them would be also... Uh, Bank of Japan as well, 6 tenths of percent uptick right now coming in uh, for uh, for uh, Japanese markets. Let's take a look at what, uh, what the Hong Kong markets are doing at this point in time because the uh, Hong Kong markets have just opened for trade, higher by about 1.4% and the Chinese market as well, that's your Shanghai. Let's see where Shanghai is actually at this point in time because it had a negative close yesterday, trading flat with a positive bias as we speak. That is uh, the uh, Chinese markets for you. And look, if you look at the trend of the last five trading sessions, it has actually seen uh, uh, almost a negative close coming in. But for now, a flat move coming in for the Chinese markets as well. And let's take a look at what Kospi is doing because uh, 
uh, uh, you have news reports uh, reporting that uh, uh, North Korea has uh, most likely launched a ballistic missile once again. So on back of that, if you look at uh, Kospi, it's actually trading flat with the positive bias. So flat cues coming in or from the Asian markets and that's ditto was reflecting when you look at the gift nifty as well. We are expecting to open flat for today's trading session, Shriyansi. Well, absolutely. And let's see how that pans out for us. But we also have a very jam-packed lineup for you on the market at 9.20. We'd be in conversation with S. Narain, ED and CIO, ICICI Prudential, AMC to discuss the markets and more with him. And at 9.40 then, Sunil Subramaniam, market expert, will be talking to us about whether there's caution over SME IPOs that he's thinking is warranted at this point, 9.50. We'd also chat with Pranav Haldia, MD Prime Database Group, to talk about the rise of new age tech as well. And at 10 a.m., then Kamlesh Gandhi, CMD, MES Financial Services, will be talking to us about the company's growth roadmap. And to decode the growth roadmap of Borisil as well, at 10.20, we'd also be chatting with Srivan Kheruka as well, who's the Managing Director of Borisil. So keep an eye on all of those interesting conversations. All right, and that is uh, what's lined up for you right here on ET now. But you have people who are queuing up actually at polling booths in uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Remember, the voting be has begun for the assembly elections in Jammu and Kashmir. This is the first time uh, ever that there's an assembly elections uh, since the bifurcation coming in. They have 24 constituencies spread across uh, seven districts in the Union Territory that's gone into polls in the phase one and this is amidst a tight security arrangement so those are the visuals coming in on your screen that is uh, the polling that's underway in Jammu and Kashmir but uh, apart from that which are the other headlines that you need to watch out for let's hear out in the Welcome back. Thank you so much for staying tuned in. Well, let's get you some macro updates then. And India's August rate deficit widened, crossing $29 billion. This is more than what we recorded in July or even in August in 2023. When you take a look at exports, then exports declined in over the previous month to $34 billion. While when you take a look at imports, hit an all-time high. Up to $64 billion is what the figure was in terms of imports. Services exports stood at over $30 billion. While when you take a look at imports, they were at $15 billion as well. So that really is what August trade deficit data is indicating. And that largely is the kind of handover that we have. When you take a look at what brokerages had to say then, Goldman Sachs is talking about how this is a 10-month high on increased gold imports, and that is something that Goldman Sachs flagged. When you take a look at what BOFA flagged, they're talking about how gold as well as intermediate imports drove a surprise as well. And in terms of the services surplus, they're talking about how that is going to be growing as tourism increases as well. So that's the word coming in from BOFA. Lastly, let's take a quick look at what Nomura also had to say about this because they're talking about how the trade deficit also widens amid turbulence in exports and that is something that they highlighted. In addition to higher gold imports and weak exports and that is something that also made it to Nomura's ra uh, radar, Cheryl. All right, so that's all about the trade gap and uh, something that we all need to watch out for very closely. And it's been after a while, actually, we saw such a jump coming in, at least for the inter-trade uh, deficit. But uh, the Prime Minister has actually uh, set a plan uh, to go ahead and boost India's electronic sector to above $500 billion by 2030. The announcement was made during his uh, address at the Semicon India 2024 event in Greater Noida. And commenting on the same ambition, you have ICEA chairman uh, Pankaj Mohindru who said that the certain sectors will have to emerge as champion sectors and do heavy, list, uh, heavy lifting to achieve the target. Listen in. He is the leader who has given uh, wind to our sales mm -hmm. in the last decade when we achieved this unprecedented 2100% per, growth in mobile phone manufacturing and 400% overall growth in electronics uh, it is it has uh, 500 billion has frankly taken our breath away uh, it's a unprecedented uh, growth from 115 to 500 we'll have to grow by like 20 to 25 percent per year mm. now uh, he, he obviously has something special in his mind that uh, to lift uh, India up there are certain sectors uh, which will be champion sectors uh, who have to do the heavy lifting. 
today capital is chasing uh, our industry mm -hmm. and uh, i was uh, joking with the uh, listed companies that now you are on the treadmill and it's not 5 kilometers uh, per hour it's mm -hmm. you know it's something like 8 and you have to run faster and faster and we have to achieve that so let's keep it going with important commentary coming in bright and early this morning and let's switch focus then to the renewable energy space that has really been powering through speaking exclusively to ET now new and renewable energy minister Pralad Joshi discusses growth plans for India's renewable sector listen in to what he had to say about those plans then if at all you consider even only state wise it is nearly about uh, 520 gigawatt and 32 point uh, uh, 5 lakh crores investment in coming uh, for almost 5 to 6 years. We were discussing with some of the companies. They are of the opinion that uh, uh, they, are, they are dealing with inadequate uh, transmission lines, especially with the projects they are setting up closer to the uh, you know coastal areas, clo near coastal areas. So any such uh, specific instructions to the department to, to address this issue? No, no, that, uh, see, this is, we are only here, we can assure them, assure them about the sector investment and other things. The transmission line and other things, though Ministry of Renewable Energy is involved, we are investing fund, that is being implemented by the Ministry of the Power. Whatever such issues are raised, we have noted it down and very shortly, within a week or 15 days, we will have a detailed meeting with the Ministry of Power. Sir, uh, PSUs ke saath, jo aapka, uh, jo aapke department ke andar jo PSUs aate hain, uh, unse bhi baat chit ho rahi thi, to wo keh rahe thai ki, example ke taur pe IREDA, uh, 4 se 5 lakh kroor rupay ka investment hai agle, uh, agle 5-6 saal mein. To, sawaal is mein ye hai ki, IREDA jaisi companies ko support karne ke liye, jo new financing norms honge, usko lekar aap kaise aage badeenge? Uske liye, jo kuch bhi jorurat hai, Ministry of Finance, Financial Services ka jo mantra le hai, department hai, udar se baat karke hum aage badeenge. All right. In fact, my uh, colleague Pri uh, Prakash also caught up with uh, Irida uh, CMD on the sidelines of the Renewable Energy Summit uh, to talk about uh, the government's move uh, coming in for the 10% stake dilution. Let's listen into what he has to say. We will be going for fresh issue because we require fresh capital for our net worth addition because we have to maintain a healthy CRAR. So, post our IPO, our CRAR was 25%. It has come down to 20 and the kind of disbursement plan what we have, our CRAR will further go down. So any uh, uh, ratio of below 18% is not a healthy signal. So we have to periodically pump in equity. So we have decided to infuse equity to a tune of 4,500 crore to 5,000 crore this year end. For that, whatever natural dilution will happen, that will happen for Government of India. Government of India is not going to sell anything. Automatic percentage dilution will happen. We have sought 10%, up to 10%. We are waiting, maybe in a couple of days we will be getting the approval. Alright, let's keep it going with commentary then. And on the sidelines of the Renewable Energy Investment Summit, Tata Power CEO and MD says most of their initiatives will be in the renewable space. He also shares the CAPEX roadmap for the coming year. Listen in to what he had to say then. So uh, this year we are investing nearly 20,000 crores, out of which uh, nearly 60% is in our clean energy space. Uh, similarly, every year we will be investing in the range of 20 to 25,000 crores to set up nearly 2 to 2.5 gigawatt of uh, renewable projects. Uh, apart from that, of course, we do also invest in uh, our other projects such as our transmission projects and distribution projects as also in the pumped hydro. So you will find that uh, in the non-carbon space, Tata Power investment will be nearly 90 to 95 percent. And uh, the whole ecosystem of power sector is something that uh, Tata Power will invest uh, as a part of its future growth. As you are aware that the government has already announced a green taxonomy in the budget. So do you think that it is going to play a crucial role and that should be announced as soon as possible? Uh, I agree that the uh, government has announced about it. Uh, we are waiting for the details of this. Uh, and uh, this will again uh, go, uh, 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 go to create a great opportunity on taxonomy initiatives that companies and the country should take. Uh, we feel that uh, once the details are out, we will be participating and, uh, and implement many of these initiatives and programs. 
A week after, weeks after the Labour Ministry asked aggregators to onboard themselves and their platform workers in the eShram portal, sources suggest that the government is set to meet with about a dozen aggregators to discuss the welfare schemes for the gig workers. Makili Aishwarya is here with all the details. Aishwarya, over to you. Well, the government is all set to discuss social security as well as uh, welfare benefits for gig workers, along with a couple of aggregators. What we're learning from sources is that about uh, 11 plus platform aggregators will be meeting with the Labor and Employment Minister Mansuk Mandavi around 12 p.m. today. Uh, what we're also learning and given to understand is that the meeting is regarding onboarding of gig workers on the eShram portal, which uh, the ministry has already announced. But as far as the agenda is concerned, it is related to the social welfare schemes or the uh, social benefits that gig workers will get in uh, discussion with not only the aggregators, but also the ministry. Now, a uh, few of the companies which will be present during this meeting include Amazon, Flipkart, Zomato, Blinkit also, uh, Uber, Urban Company, Swiggy and Swiggy Instamart, E-Commerce Express, Ola, Porter, Blue Smart are few of the companies which will be meeting with the Labor and Employment Minister this afternoon. Now, the companies and ministry are likely to discuss social security benefits, as I mentioned earlier, and the possible points of discussion uh, as far as social security is concerned. Uh, two key uh, important uh, benefits that they would require is, of course, healthcare and accident, uh, accidental benefits. And uh, also, they will be discussing how the gig workers will be onboarded onto the eShram portal, uh, the whole process of how this will be done. And so after uh, the onboarding happens, this data will be used to uh, give social security benefits, not only on the central government level, but also on the state level, because a lot of states such as Rajasthan and Karnataka already have a social security benefits uh, a bill or rule in their particular state. So uh, this is overall uh, a step taken by the Labour Ministry towards uh, securing and uh, giving benefits to gig workers uh, across platforms. For getting us that update, Ashwara, but moving on then to the political landscape, voting is underway for the first phase of elections in Jammu and Kashmir. 24 of the 90 constituencies in the Union Territory are polling today. This includes 8 in Jammu and 16 in the Kashmir Valley. And this is the first time that elections are being held after the abrogation of Article 370 and also the first time after Jammu and Kashmir also became a Union Territory. So let's go across to my colleague Sahil who's standing by with a ground report there. Sahil, tell us a little more about what the environment is like there. Voting has started uh, and today uh, 24 constituencies are going to polls. Uh, 23 lakh voters are going to decide the future and fate of 219 candidates across these constituencies. Right now we are reporting from South Kashmir's Pulwama. Uh, this uh, polling station is in Avantipura and here you see uh, CRPF Jawans are guarding this police uh, uh, this polling station. Jammu and Kashmir police has also deployed. There is multi-tier security arrangement that is in place. With first light, the voters have also started arriving uh, at this particular polling station here in South Kashmir Pulwama, which was once an epicenter of violence and militancy, but those days have gone. And in recent 2024 Lok Sabha elections, we have seen, in fact, uh, a high voter turnout across Kashmir Valley, particularly in South Kashmir. And these are the images. Uh, people, in fact, voters are coming out and uh, casting their votes, and the voting has already started. Uh, there is live webcasting uh, 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 that has been put in place by the Election Commission of India to ensure free and fair elections. Uh, these voters basically are coming up, lining up here in uh, Avantipura polling station, going inside and casting their votes. Uh, today, uh, uh, in fact, uh, as I said, to, uh, 24 constituencies of uh, South Kashmir, uh, Anantana, Kulgam, Shupaya and Pulwam, along with Doda and Kashtwad, which is basically uh, the other side of Peer Pancha range. Uh, their eight constituencies are also going to uh, uh, polls today. Uh, this is significant election because it's happening for, for the first time after the abrogation of Article 370. This was long due. People were waiting for this day to, in fact, cast their votes and elect their own government. Uh, so political parties were also demanding uh, early elections in Jammu and Kashmir. After 2019, there was this long demand uh, by, from the people uh, and from political parties as well. 
All right, let's move on now and let's talk about some of the stocks and the sectors that have been focused in today's uh, trading session. There have been a couple of management meets. Meets you have Goldman Sachs that shortlisted the highlights of uh, L&T Management meet while City met with the CFO of LTI Mine Tree. Ashesha is here with all the takeaway. Uh, good morning, Ashesha, and uh, what are uh, the management saying in this meet uh, with Goldman Sachs and with City? Well, absolutely. First up, let's talk about LTI Mindtree, where City met with the management to talk about the latest trends in the industry, especially with respect to demand, where the management said that second quarter revenue trends have been very similar to what they saw in the first quarter. As far as margins are concerned, they continue to reiterate that margins are expected to be under pressure on account of growth concerns. Uh, City, meanwhile, has maintained its sales stance on LTI Mindtree with a target price of 5,635. Uh, they say a uh, Management says that they are not seeing any pickup as far as discretionary spending is concerned and margins are likely to remain under pressure. Meanwhile, l and will also be in focus and that is because Goldman Sachs met with the management and they say that the management continues to remain very constructive on India CapEx story. Uh, in fact, not only India CapEx story but also the demand orders that they are getting from Middle East. They say CapEx in intensive private investments uh, is going to be a growth driver for the company from here on. Uh, they are maintaining their buy stance on l and with a target price of 3,700 and they also highlighted that data centers, semiconductors, green hydrogen and potentially nuclear energy will be the growth drivers for the company from here on. So l and and LTI Mindtree, both these stocks in focus on the back of management commentary. Shisha for that update but while you're with us let's keep it going with management meets then and let's shift focus to United Breweries then what is on CEO Vivek Gupta's priority list then? Well, absolutely. United Breweries will also be in focus and that is because Kotak Securities met with the management. Um, Vivek Gupta, CEO, articulated four priorities for the company going forward. First, uh, he says that he is ensuring availability of all SKUs across all markets uh, to ensure a premiumization is helping the company going forward, modernization of manufacturing network, regulatory advocacy and enhancing operational capability. So these are the four priorities. Uh, that the management is working on. As far as their guidance going forward is concerned, he also said that the company aspires to achieve uh, double digit volume growth with EBIT margin expansion to 12. Uh, 10 to 12 percent versus 6 percent margins that the company had reported in FY24. Uh, they also expect improvement in bottle recovery to about 72 percent going forward from 65 percent currently and this is expected to be a major growth margin driver for the company from here on. So some important management commentary where the management highlighted four key priorities and that they expect double digit growth growing forward, United Breweries will also be in focus on the back of this. All right, thank you so much for that, Ashesha, for outlining the companies uh, or the stocks that will be in focus on back of the management be, uh, meet and the takeaways coming from that. But on that note, we slip into a break on this edition of Market Cafe. When we come back, more stocks to discuss, don't go anywhere. Welcome back, you're watching Market Cafe on ET Now and let's talk about uh, what Morgan Stanley has to say in this strategy note for the emerging markets. In the emerging market strategy note, you have Morgan Stanley that has mentioned the fact that India has now actually gone ahead and displaced China as the largest MSCI EM market. Uh, they're saying that as, as of the end of uh, the month of August, you have India that's now largest uh, emerging market as per the MSCI investable market indices. Remember, the last month as well, India overtook actually China in this particular segment. What they're saying is that China's weight has fallen by a half since uh, peaking in early 2021. And now India is uh, the sixth largest market globally, just narrowly behind France. They believe that uh, India will continue to gain share due to the market outperformance. We have new issuances coming up as well as the liquidity uh, improvements that India is witnessing. Therefore, the remaining overweight on India while maintaining an underweight stance on China in the pan-Asia emerging market asset allocation. Uh, also, they're saying that India's uh, nominal GDP growth rate is running in the low teens currently, which is more than three times that of China. So uh, there is a significant change coming in uh, for the Morgan Stanley strategy when it comes to the emerging market. And India is definitely a preferred bet coming in for Morgan Stanley. They're also saying that uh, the fact that uh, India's uh, nominal GDP growth rate is running in the low teens currently is generating a profound divergent operating 
an earnings growth environment for companies between the two geographies and therefore they're preferring India over China given the fact now India has actually gone ahead and displaced China as the largest MSCI emerging market actually Shriyansi. All right then, so let's get a little stock specific now and Rhea standing by with a list of stocks that you should keep on your radar bright and early this morning. Rhea? So let's take a look at the stocks that are going to be in focus today. First up, we have a big bulk deal happening on Suraj Estates, where an LIC mutual fund, FlexiCap fund, has bought 2.84 lakh shares at rupees 758.89. Uh, so definitely keeping an eye out on Suraj Estates. On the back of that news, we also have some positive news flow for oil and gas stocks today, uh, because the government of India has cut the windfall tax on petroleum crude to zero from the earlier rupees 1,850 per ton, with effect from the 18th of September. So keeping an eye out on oil and gas stocks as well. Let's shift focus though to NTPC for which the government has uh, accorded their approval for the NPCIL and NTPC JV company called Ashwini to build, own and operate nuclear power plants in India and additionally the government of India has also approved the transfer of the Banswara Rajasthan atomic power project from NPCIL to the JV company and uh, further the government has also approved the exemption uh, to NPCIL to invest more than rupees 500 crores and for NDPC they have also uh, received an exemption to invest more than rupees 5000 crores in a single JV or subsidiary company and this is uh, going to enable adequate financing for accelerated nuclear power capacity addition in India so definitely keeping uh, NDPC see in uh, focus today. We also have Torrent Power in focus since they have received a letter of intent from the Maharashtra State Electricity Distribution Company since it has been selected as the successful bidder for the supply of, uh, of the 1500 megawatt energy storage capacity from a pumped hydro storage project. Now MSE uh, DCL will produce uh, energy storage capacity of 1500 megawatts from this pumped hydro storage project for a period of 40 years and it is important to highlight here that this is the first long term uh, pump storage capacity capacity LOI to be awarded in the country. We also have LIC and Biocon in focus today since LIC has increased its uh, shareholding uh, in the equity shares of Biocon from the earlier 4.982% uh, to 5.023% uh, and they acquired 5 lakh shares on the 13th of September. We also have REC in focus uh, since at the RE Invest 2024 conference the company has signed non-binding MOUs uh, with RE developers aggregating to about 1.12 lakh crore rupees which will be implemented over a period of five years and REC has also undertaken a non-binding financial commitment of raising its renewables a loan book to over rupees 3 lakh crores by 2030 and this is going to uh, increase the share of renewables from the current 8% to 30% by 2030 as REC's loan book is projected to be rupees 10 lakh crores by 2030. Lastly, we have HCC in focus since they have authorized a fundraise of up to rupees 1,500 crores. So definitely keeping an eye out on all of these stocks today. All right, definitely we'll watch out for all of those stocks that are in focus in today's strange session on back of the news flows. But Gaurav is here to tell us all the stocks that have been focused on back of brokerage notes. Very good morning to you, Gaurav. Well, yes. First, let's talk about Bajaj Autos. We recently saw that the company launched two motorbikes yesterday. And on back of this now, CLS says that these motorbikes are actually an, a good entry point when we talk about a 400cc. That actually looks promising, but there are a few concerns as per CLS. What they say is that competitive intensity is increasing, growth is moderating, and at the same time, when we talk about export volumes, they are also moderating. And as a result, they have maintained out underperform rating at a target price of 7,000 rupees on Bajaj Autos. Next, let's talk about Bajaj Finance because Morgan Stanley has now maintained its overweight rating and a target price of 9,000 rupees on this company. What they believe is that the focus will be on the standalone financials and this will gradually rise for the company. Apart from that, they are expecting company and investors to focus more on consolidated metrics in the immediate immediate term. When we talk about EPS now, they have cut down the EPS estimates almost by 1.5% for the next two years. But what they say is that ROE is at at, at an attractive level and that is why they have maintained their overweight rating. Apart from that, let's also watch out for some insurance players because JP Morgan has now said that the distribution is diversifying when we talk about life insurance. Insurers are actually investing in tech which will improve the channel uh, productivity and at the same time this will actually reduce the pressure on the margins. At the same time, they also believe that in second half of the year we may see high margins and new businesses actually bringing high margins in the business. This actually the entire segment according to JP Morgan is entering into a 
period of weaker share price which is specifically during September to December and in this period now they are preferring more diversified players such as SBI Life and ICICI Pro Life. What they also have done is that they have reiterated their overweight trading on New India Assurance on the back of the improved fundamentals and lastly they are underweight on LIC because of the potential margin pressure that they see in the company. So definitely watching out on all these counters on the back of the brokerage note that we have received today. Absolutely, a very uh, sorry. Thank you so much for that, Gaurav. Actually, for outlining all the stocks that we focus on brokerages. Remember, there are a couple of stocks that you need to watch out for, especially when you talk about the news flow. Especially Suraj Estates, you have uh, that particular counter in focus on back of the bulk deal because you have the LIC mutual fund Flexi Cap Fund that has bought shares in the company via a bulk deal yesterday. So those are the stocks to watch out for in trade today, Shayansi. Well, absolutely lots to watch out for, Cheryl. But with that, we're completely out of time on this edition of Market Cafe on ET. Now from me, Shayansi Singh, Cheryl D'Souza, as well as the entire team that put this show together. Thank you so much for tuning in. You don't go anywhere because the market takes all of the action forward. If you like this video then like share and subscribe to ET Now